Thank you for tuning in to see Shake the Nations. We are glad that you're here. Please take a moment to send us a comment and to share the link to this broadcast with your friends and family in social media. Love Center Affirmation. At the Love Center, we believe that Jesus, the Word of God, made flesh, is the bread of life. This study of the bread satisfies the hunger of our soul to know the way of God and to know His heart. When we accept and believe what we study, we also satisfy the thirst of our mind to understand the mind of God. The Holy Spirit will always be faithful to us as he reveals through the scripture all the things about God that we need to know and understand. We are blessed as we break bread together. Let's be blessed together right now with Pastor Byron L. Broussard. Praise the Lord, everyone. Good evening. It's time for Bible study. And all over the world, I'd like to welcome you to Love Center Atlanta's Bible study. At this time, I'm going to call on you to share, make sure other people know what we're doing and uh, how good it is to you. And if you will, just be as graphic as you need to be to get them to explore the possibilities of being a part of uh, our time together. We're going to pray in just a moment, but before we do that, I'd like to mention what we'll be studying from Calvary to Pentecost. We'll define Calvary and Pentecost, and we will explore 
what it's all about when the game changer comes into our lives. I, in, I really believe in my soul that Holy Spirit is the game changer in the life of a believer. Uh, the word carnal, which is flesh, mind, gnosis, thought, being a human being is the regular level. And then when the presence of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the third, as we believe, the third portion, person in the Trinity, the threefold expression of our God. He is the presence of God and indeed changes everything. We say, Holy Ghost, not optional, adding so much to our lives. We'll explore that in just a minute, but right now, let's pray together. God, we love you, thank you, and we are sure that we need you. We need you right now. We appreciate all that you have already done. We're grateful for the things that you're doing in the moment. Right now, you're healing people. You're restoring families. You're reversing things in our minds that have set up roadblocks against your will in our lives. We thank you. We're grateful for that. And even now, as we begin this time together, studying your word, our expectation level begins to rise. Aches and pains and issues and thoughts that would come against your plan for us, they must sit down, take a back seat, and be silent in the presence of your voice. Speak now, please, Holy Spirit, and bless us as we need to be. In Jesus' name, we praise you and we pray. Amen. God bless you. Our Bibles are the place that we're going to be together. And I just want to make this note before we get into the word. We talk about unity, and, there, and, and, and that's a powerful and necessary part of life. But there is no unity in the flesh. The truth of the matter is we come from everywhere, all kinds of different ideologies, ethnicities. Our DNA is different. The way we look is different. The way we've been culturally stratified is different. And we would live and die before we can take ourselves and stay for any length of time in a unified fashion. But there is a way to be unified, and here's what it is. We were created by the same spirit. In the beginning, we were created by God. We are his crafted handiwork. And his spirit, when present, is the force of unity. It's the place where we are the same. And it will bless us when we surrender our will to God, open our heart to him, receive the Holy Ghost. And when we receive his presence in our lives, we'll experience unity truthfully for the first time. Hopefully I'll remember to share um, some of my initial experiences with the Holy Ghost uh, as, as a young, as a, as a child actually. Um, and, and I pray that it will fit in the lesson and make the point even a little bit more clear. Uh, if you will join me in the Old Testament, there are a few places there in Psalm and Zechariah and in Joel where we'll look at the scripture and uh, gain some insight uh, about this uh, time from Calvary to Pentecost. We'll lay the foundation, of course, with the Old Testament. Starting with the Psalm, if you come with me to Psalm 22 and beginning with the 11th verse going through verse 17, the scripture reads like this. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion, a wild lion ready to bite. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. All my heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. That, that sounds like he's just scared. He's, 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 he's just, just out of it. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. Uh, my tongue like, like a piece of broken pottery. Uh, my tongue cleaved to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Verse 16 says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet, they biting me. I may tell all my bones, they may look and stare upon me. Looks like things just don't look so good. Things are, things are really, this is, this is a cry of anguish 
and uh, laying out just how bad things are. And I don't know if you've ever been in a rough, tight, terrible situation, but when you are, it sounds a lot like this. You may not speak in the old King's English like this person is, but in your own tone, from your, the language of your culture, the language of your hood, you speak and you say what you say, and things just don't look bad, don't look good. They look bad, actually. And uh, all of us can relate to having rough and bad times. The beauty of the Spirit of the Lord is that He can see us where we are. He meets us in it and then lifts us out of it in the hope that we will acknowledge who our help is, give Him praise for it, and live in the newness of life, living in victory instead of what's being described in this cry of anguish, a bad situation where one is looking toward defeat. The next one in the Old Testament is Zechariah chapter 12. One verse, verse 10, Zechariah 12 and verse 10, the cup of trembling, another rough situation in this Old Testament reading, 12 and verse 10. And verse 10 says, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness in bitterness for his firstborn. One more time. Uh, it's the repentance. It's under the subject of repentance of Jerusalem. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll read verse 9 with verse 10 this time. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Grace and petitions of prayers. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Moving a little closer to the point of Calvary. Now, let's look at Joel, the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. We'll go to the New International Version uh, for Joel uh, 2.28. Let's, let's start there. And afterward, I will pour out, this is verse 28, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Now, things looking up, things are being, being promised uh, that are different than defeat, that, that are different than, than just the acknowledgement of rough times. I just want to use this as, as, as a bit of, maybe put some grout in, inside the, the foundation tiles here. Um, we are realists and truth tellers and believers of uh, not fantasy. This world has some terrible and rough and awful and incredibly difficult things in it. And even when you get saved, giving your life to Jesus Christ, crazy things are going to occur, are going to happen because we are in this world. But we are not of this world. Therefore, we have agent, an agency in Christ through the Holy Ghost working on our behalf that can change the game, that can change our situations. It is this hope of God's glory, his presence, his help, his assistance that makes the difference in the life of the believer. We have a hope in Christ that changes everything for us. I want to advance uh, the notion of this hope in Christ. I want for you to be able to taste it and see it and hunger for it and begin to position yourself to receive it. He is, is, is loving and present and his kindness endures after all kinds of chaos has occurred. He makes sense of things that just 
don't make sense when you're going through it, when you feel rejected and when you feel picked on and all these things that I would imagine can come to the heart of a person. And I'm looking at the cry of anguish in Psalm uh, that we read first, Psalm 22. And it didn't get much better in Zechariah, but as you can see in Joel, things are looking up, my friends. And so we're going to look uh, to Pentecost and let's give the hope of that. But we've got to go to Calvary first. We have to look and see the difficult reality and assess it and, and see how indeed we got victory through Christ over the difficult circumstance that, that happens in, in real life, real living in the flesh. All right, let's go to the Gospels now. And uh, in the New Testament, Matthew 28, Luke 23, and then we'll end up in the book of Acts for the, the meat of our lesson. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 and verses 19 and 20. Matthew chapter 28 and verses 19 and 20. Matthew's the first for, for our new people is the first book uh, in the New Testament. And uh, it's the first of the Gospels that is in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke and John. Uh, for our old veterans that, you know, been reading the Bible since uh, birth, you know, be patient because it's a joy. It's, we, we, we're, it means we're growing if we have some new people uh, who that would apply to. Matthew 20, 28 and verses 19 and 20. All right. Here's what it says. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them listen closely teaching them to observe all things leave nothing out pay attention to everything that Christ has made available to us because this word is life changing it's life giving this word has the power to heal it can lift up a head. It can change a mentality. And so Jesus said, don't blow anything I've said off. Uh, teach the people when you start taking responsibility for uh, disciples who become disciples of Jesus. Remember, the disciples are not our disciples, but the disciples belong to God, the, the disciples of Christ. Amen. So he said, you go teach the nations. You've baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. And then in verse 20, it says, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. All right. Matthew 28 and verse 19. 20 says that, and we'll go to Luke now in uh, chapter 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke, that's the third of the Gospels. And chapter 23, in verse 33. And this is what is found in, in this passage. It says in chapter 23 and verse 33. Uh, it says, and when they will come to the place which is called Calvary. They, excuse me, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. One more time. And when they will come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. That's the location of the crucifixion. The place which is called Calvary, Golgotha's Hill, Skull Hill. There they killed, murdered, crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. You remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross and last week during Holy Week, all over the world, people were preaching the seven last sayings of Christ. Do you remember, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Um, do you remember the men who precipitate this discussion? And, and are the receivers of this word, this day you will be with me in paradise. Christ is directly 
um, opening the door to the sinner saying, I, you, you have not earned this, but through me, I'm, I'm your, I'm your uh, stand in. I'm, I will vouch for you. Praise the Lord. I am blessing you. I'm giving you grace and mercy. And I want for you to recognize what's happening. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And you'll be there as a result of forgiveness. You'll be there as a result of mercy. Can you feel that? Anybody, can, can, can you feel any of that? You'll be there as a result of forgiveness and mercy. It is the mercy that is the benefit that all of us receive. What a blessing. What a blessing for Christ to have actually had to put up with their foolishness and then say, but I will be your pass into paradise. Praise the Lord through mercy, through forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In verse 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you know how they responded? They started gambling for his clothes. How about that? You're talking about some major insensitivity. Uh, you, you're talking about being in the presence. Listen, that's why in flesh, you've got to understand, this is not about knowledge of the Holy Ghost. You can know about the Holy Spirit all you want to, but this is the presence of the Holy Ghost. It's, it's different from gnosis. It's different from in our minds what we know, what we learn, what we read off the page or the screen. It's different, and this is the difference. His, his, the knowledge of him will present to you a concept that you can either accept or reject. His presence is undeniable. I, I recall some of my earliest experiences with the presence of the Holy Spirit. I ended up at 4 a.m. in the morning in front of a dormitory at Grambling State University at a youth camp, and, and I was not alone. Uh, I was in the presence of hundreds of other young brothers, and we were praising God and singing. It was a, a Baptist youth encampment. We were from trunk line, institutional, established, traditional uh, Baptist churches. It was not the norm, but we had been praying, praising God, seeking him, studying the scripture, and he decided, the Holy Spirit of a living God decided that he was coming to Gramlin and that he was going to show up early in the morning, that he was going to roll through the dormitory, and that when we would normally be sleepy, grouchy, upset about being awakened and all of that, that he was going to shift the atmosphere and claim for himself the heart, mind, soul, and spirit of some very, very open young, young, young men, young boys. And he changed my game. Hallelujah. He changed my game for the rest of my life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. More to come on that a little bit later, probably. But I want for us to consider uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit and how he changes the game. Did we, we went to Luke. Let's go to Acts. Let's go to Acts. Acts. The Acts, as a matter of fact, if you look at it, it's the Acts of the of, of the apostles under the direction and influence of the Holy Ghost, the Acts, the Acts, all right? A-C-T-S, chapter one, the first one, Acts, praise the Lord. And when you get there, as a matter of fact, I'm going to read from one to eight, if, you, if, you, if you'll humor me. It says Acts one and eight on our sheets, and we're going to stop at eight, um, I'm going to try at least. The former treatise, I have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach unto the day in which he was taken up after that through the Holy Ghost, he'd given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had showed himself alive after his passion. Now, we know the passion is what well, we were dealing with and working with through Holy Week, the mistreatment of Christ, the lying on him in courtrooms and the beating and the scourging and the Ultimately, the hanging, the, the nails, and the, and the crucifixion uh, of Christ on the cross. Um, he showed himself alive after that by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking 
of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 4 says, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not leave Jerusalem, depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which uh, he said, you heard me say it. You heard me talk about it. Verse 5 says, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not long from now. Verse 6 says, when therefore they came together, they asked him, Lord, is it, is it happening? Well, we would... We, we were, you know, we, we, we were all excited when you came to Jerusalem. We knew the king was in town. It was on and popping and cracking. We were about to get our offices back, our status back, our swag and style back. We were going to be on top again. Well, you know, excuse me, sir, I don't mean to be out of order, but I want to ask you, is it about to happen now? Will the kingdom be restored to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know that. That's not the right answer if you're trying to win the favor of flesh. But Jesus is not moving in flesh. He's not trying to impress flesh. He's not trying to get the approval of flesh. And sometimes you are in the craziest, most unpopular position when God is using you and speaking to you because your present circumstances may look like you need to be begging everybody. Made me looking like you need to be kissing fingernails, toenails, uh, hair, backsides, and, and trying to win favor and curve favor with all of the people you possibly can because it is a flesh um, situation. It is a situation that looks bad in the flesh, but God is working in the spirit realm and will impact all flesh. And it's amazing. We call it supernatural. That means it is above and beyond the reaches and control of flesh. And when God starts to operate in the supernatural, he impacts all flesh with what he does. And when we who believe, hallelujah, if you're going to believe in Christ, then you are certainly going to eventually begin to embrace the supernatural. But you won't do that in your flesh. You may learn about it in your flesh. You may study it and read it and see it on your computer and find it in your Bible, but it won't be revealed to you in your flesh. Do you remember Jesus talking to his disciples? He said, he said, who, who men say I am? And, and then that old boy hollered. He said, what? Thou art the Christ, son of the living God. He said, Junior, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you because I know you. I know you. You and your old boy Thomas you know, and the rest of y'all, I know y'all. And so flesh and blood didn't, didn't hip you to that. It didn't turn you on to that. It didn't reveal that to you, but my spirit. And some of us haven't been in, oh Lord have mercy. Some of us the spirit hasn't spoken directly to in that manner in a long time because we have not been yielded to it because the circumstances in our lives may have been a little too smooth, a little too easy, or a little too routine. And so maybe tonight is the night that God shows you, I have shaken up your world. I have tightened the screws in some areas of your life so that you will turn to me and pay attention to me in a way that you haven't paid attention to me in a long time, just so that I can speak to the part of you that matters more than any other part of you, your spirit. I want to get past your eyes and what they see. I want to get past your mind and what it thinks. I want to get past your ears and what they hear. And I want to get in your spirit, man, and I want to start rearranging furniture. I want to start shaping you and molding you after my way and after my will. Is anybody ready for it? Well, hallelujah. Don't, don't, don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody. But just say to the Lord, yes, Lord. Say it down in your spirit. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Whatever way you need to do it. Yes, Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, uh, it, it says here, as we, as we continue in, in, in the book of Acts, it's not for you to know time, season. The Father put that in his own power. And verse 8 says, but you'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to uttermost parts of the earth, all over the place. Amen? You, you will be witnesses. This was, you'll witness, you'll tell my, you'll testify to me. Praise the Lord. You, without shame, without fear, even in the midst, and, and, and let's deal with this truth. Jesus has just been crucified. The acts 
excuse me, and Pentecost, which is what verse 8 is describing, the coming of the Holy Ghost. And uh, let's, let's peep into the definition just a little bit. Pentecost is a Christian feast that's observed. It's a movable feast, but it's observed the seventh Sunday after the resurrection of Jesus. After Resurrection Sunday, seven weeks later, 50 days to be specific, we celebrate Pentecost. Pentecost which is the, the 50, the five is in the pent, Pentecost. 50 days after the resurrection, we celebrate the descent of the Holy Ghost upon the, on the apostles. And what that does, what that does is it cranks the engine to, for the foundation of the Lord's church to be laid. All of the things that they had been exposed to, all of the things they had witnessed as Jesus is the teacher, they are now about to come to play and things that, that they couldn't understand because the flesh was, was unable to grasp it would be revealed to them by the spirit of Christ. Hallelujah. And it's different. It makes all the difference. And there are people who are listening to this broadcast tonight. You are witnesses. You know the difference in you, in your flesh, and you in the spirit of Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, if you will, uh, join me here, Acts 2, 1 through 4, and we'll put a, put a seal and begin to deal with the key principles and the definitions before we land the plane and say good night. In chapter 2, the apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together with one accord in one place. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Verse 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at, at, at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noise about, why? Why? Because the, the festival was going on. Amen? People had traveled to be there. It was, it was, a, it was a, a normal Jewish festival. They were observing it. But some abnormal, supernatural stuff was taking place. Oh, my God. Oh, man. You know, when there is a societal shift, when there's a cultural shift, when there's a religious shift, when there's a spiritual shift, it is very often on the heels of a chaotic reality. I feel as though we're being set up in our nation, in our, in our world, for a powerful shift in the spirit realm that will manifest itself in the, in the people because we are dealing with a uh, time we've been shut down for a year with, with COVID. We, 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 we've been in this space of, of uh, uncertainty uh, and people are uh, checking belief systems and, and switching guards and, and, and digging in the scripture they'd never taken the time to deal with before, looking at things differently, just a whole lot more open because of the circumstances and situations that are uncertain. As a matter of fact, there are people who are open to the highest bidder as far as spirituality is concerned right now. And whoever blessed me first, that's what I'm going to be. Praise the Lord. And so it is only the presence of the spirit of the true and living God that can calm and bring peace and make sense out of the chaos. I'm looking for him to take full advantage of the opportunity that exists in the earth now. He has the attention, hallelujah, of the planet. Thank you, Jesus. Move. Holy Ghost, come. Move. Move in the midst of your people. Hallelujah. If you look, it says, uh, and they were filled, verse 4 is where we'll pause, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Something to consider. Let's go to our sheets right now. 
I called it the cross of COVID-19. This thing has been going on for over a year and it's still not done. I don't, I don't want to do a commercial, not a long one at least, but I want to pause and say we are not finished and so be wise and cautious. If you make an error, I would like to be wrong. I would like for us to be completely out of the woods and it's really, it's really done right now. But just in case that's not true, I ask you to be a blessing to other people and even to yourself and your own family. Be cautious, not paranoid, not weird or crazy, but and, and, and retain a hope that, that as we get through the summer and go toward the fall, what we have, have, have known as normalcy, where we can move around and travel and do the things, uh, eat at restaurants and go to movies and the things that we love to do, we'll be able to get uh, back to that, come to church and be together and hug and, and dance in the spirit and presence of God. We want all these things. However, uh, we don't want the casualties that will come from being unwise. And so as we prayerfully press toward the mark, let's make sure it's for toward the mark of the calling of the, uh, that's in Christ Jesus, the high calling that's in Christ Jesus and not just our flesh. So it would be a perfect opportunity to become acquainted with the ministry of the Holy Ghost as he is our threefold blessing. Ready? He's our comforter because this is uncomfortable. This is uncomfortable. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is a comforter. This, what's uncomfortable? Not being able to do what you want to do. I wish I had two witnesses. You know, I just, it's, I, I'm, I'm tired of this. Just, can, is that anybody's testimony? You know what? I'm smart, I'm wise, I, I read, I'm intelligent, all that, but I'm sick of this. I'm just sick of it. I'm ready to go to my big mama's house, praise the Lord, and get a squeeze, and get a hug, and have some dinner, and, and talk to my little cousins and all the folk. Folk, I don't even like that much. I want to see them right now. You know, because I'm sick of this. And we know that that's the case with a lot of people. I just need some truth being told right now. And so a lot of times we do wrong when we're sick of stuff because the human race is arrogant. We believe we're supposed to be in charge of things. And when we're not in charge of things, we lose our cotton picking mind. Back in the day, they say, you out your rabbit mind. And, 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 and so now, and the Lord that messed around and told us we're going to give you a shot. And we figured now you get your shot, that's just everything. All bets are off now. I can go wherever I want to go. I can go naked if I want to go. No nothing. No clothes if I don't want masks. None of that. I just I can do what I want to do. That's not true. That's not the case. Uh, we have... Uh, people who are not being wise, people who are not being careful and cautious. And so you have to, almost like when we're driving a car, you got to drive for yourself and you got to drive for all the other people who can't drive. Some of them who don't even have a license. Can I have a witness? So you got to deal with all the people who lie and say they got a shot and didn't, who, who lie and talk about I've been social distancing and don't, who've been going everywhere from the club to, to and kissing who knows who and wherever, hello. Now that's the end of that one. That's the end of that commercial. But as believers, we have to bless the world and it's making a larger sacrifice socially, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Sometimes financially. A lot of times physically. We have to engage at the highest of levels possible and the Holy Ghost makes that possible. He brings us into that kind of fellowship with God. And he puts us in a position where, don't you want to be useful? You talk all that talk when, we, when we're in the worship celebration and singing our songs, praying our prayers. But this is the perfect time for the church to rise above the, the, the foolishness and be useful. And then the world turn around and have a testimony. Surely these people must know the Lord. Surely these must be the elect and the chosen of God. This must be the royal priesthood. This must be the, the, the chosen people. This must be the holy nation. Talk to me, somebody. Don't you want to experience that? We can. 
but it will be by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Not in flesh. It won't be something we know we thought of, dreamed up and got there first. And we racing, trying to hustle out, hustle everybody to it. The Lord God himself will reveal it to us. We will simply have to walk in obedience into a place where God will use us in marvelous ways. I want it. I pray to God you do as well. The cross of COVID-19 has taken the lives of people. People who were alive are dead because of this pandemic and this disease that still is in the earth. Okay? Uh, it's very real. People, there's, there's someone in my life now who's just coming out of intensive care uh, in, and off a of ventilator. Okay? It's just a, a, a young, strong, vibrant woman of God with a, with a husband and children and grandchildren. And, and they did not know whether or not she would pull through and make it. And she just did. Just coming off a ventilator. That thing was breathing for her. She was, she didn't, you know, just, oh my God. And it makes it real. There are other people who did not make it. They passed away. And as a result of this deadly disease, this, this plague, this virus, this cross of COVID-19 that was performing executions and crucifixions uh, throughout this past year. And, and it is altered. If it didn't kill us, it altered all of our lives. Every single one of us. Our lives have been altered by this cross of COVID-19. It's now upon us to form and establish a vehicle to continue the work of Christ in, in our society post-COVID. This is in our lifetime. But as you look at the scripture, when the cross of Christ, Calvary, and the crucifixion on Golgotha, on Skull Hill, occurred, then they had to pick up the pieces and move forward with the teachings of Jesus Christ. This was very real. And it was as devastating to them as COVID is to us. It was as bewildering. They were, they were scared. They were fearful to be identified with the Lord who had blessed them. He was their teacher and had blessed them, but they were scared to own his name because they didn't want anybody to kill them. See, they feared for their lives because they were in their flesh and they figured they had no defense. They didn't know the Holy Ghost yet. They, did, they hadn't been that intimate with God yet. So all they knew was flesh. So I beg you not to act like we're them. Praise the Lord. We're 2,000 plus years up the road, babies. Praise the Lord. We, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope, and we don't live as those who have no hope. Praise the Lord. Not when we walk in the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. When we walk in flesh, we walk just like them who have no hope. We talk just like them who have no hope. Think and live like them who have no hope. But when the Holy Ghost has come, we get on the elevator and take a ride up to higher floors. Now, quickly, we call it, uh, we, we, they, they, ha we, they had to establish and form a ministry that would take Jesus' teachings off into the world. It was a baby. It was fledgling. It was brand new. They didn't know how. There were no regulations. There was no God rails, guide rails, and they were scared. So they needed the presence of God to come in there and give them something. And that's what the book of Acts describes to us in chapter 1 and 2. If the promise is made, but you shall receive power. And then in chapter 2, Pentecost comes. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, then the Holy Ghost sits on them and blesses them and fills them. And they begin to utter things that are glorious and heavenly and powerful. Praise the Lord. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter and, 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 and I'm going to pull it right there. Peter, y'all know him, don't you? 3,000 people get saved, get converted. The Bible said in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. It said that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got to read one before that. In verse 36, it said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made that same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what are we going to do? What shall we do? Peter said, repent. 
Peter said, I thought you'd never ask me. Hallelujah. Turn around from your wicked ways. Repent and then be baptized. All of you, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the removal of your sin and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse, that's, that's verse 38. And verse 39 says, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all far off, or far, that are far off, even as many as the Lord shall call. So what a beautiful, powerful promise. And then he delivers on that thing. Praise the Lord. And the apostles receive the spirit of Christ in their everyday life. Our assignment is to make real and to make known the intentions of Jesus Christ. And we are repeating what he taught and rehearsing how he lived and loved as an example to all the people. That's what we're doing. And we do that when the spirit, when the Holy Ghost, he's not optional. When we walk in the Holy Ghost, when we live in the Holy Ghost, when we think according to that which he places in our spirit. The Holy Ghost is not something you want to catch so you can have a good time in church. He, he, he is the comforter. That's one. When we're scared and got issues. Two, he's the teacher because we need to know the heart of God through Christ. So the Holy Spirit will teach you. When you read the scripture, he'll open it up to you. Praise the Lord and bless you in a way your little mind, the limitation. You got, you got too many limitations, got too many fears, too many hang-ups. Hallelujah. Too many mis-teachings mis and mis-thoughts. And so the Holy Ghost will put, that, put us on one accord with God. All right. Now, now, principles, one, two, three, and four. A lot of times you don't appreciate somebody till they're gone. When they're there, you just blow them off. Oh, well, ain't, ain't nobody but Jesus. Often physical presence hinders people from deep or accurate appreciation of the spirit of a person. When he's gone, they say, oh, my God, this was God right here with us. Touching, talking, healing, helping, uh, correcting. Verse two, I mean, the, number two, the enduring reality of the Christian faith testifies as to the power of God as the blessed Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, blessed Trinity. God, you remember? God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Y'all know I'm, I'm, I miss church. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. Hallelujah. No, I don't. Uh, number three, true worship of and service to God requires Intimacy. You, if, if it's dry, you, 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 you got to have something to put with it. You got to have something to wet it. If it's a dry person, you got to have something to wet them so you can take them. You know, if, if you, you ever go into a room full of dry people, they just weren't blessed with the gift of a sense of humor, gift of gab or nothing. And, and I'll be honest with you. First thing I do when I go in a room like that, I speak to everybody. You know, like I, I survey and I try to feel them and sense them. And I look and I look, okay, all right, okay. And next thing I do, I look and survey and I play some music. I, I said, Lord, what's the music that, that could, 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 could wet this room? Because it's dry in here. You need to loosen it up. And, and, and to bring in a presence that is different than the one that is presently dominating that atmosphere. Hallelujah. Amen? And so the Holy Spirit will change an atmosphere uh, by, by wet, it's like wetting the place, giving it moisture, allowing it some additional opportunity to exist. All right. Uh, the, the third thing is the true worship of uh, and, and service of God requires intimacy, true devotion, and that's where the, the, the Holy Spirit's presence pr provides that opportunity for closeness with God and intimacy. Um, and then the uplook to worship, you know, to get in his presence and, and just forget, you, almost, you forget where you are, who you are, what you got on, you know, what you have, what you need, who, all of those things uh, become secondary when, when the Holy Ghost is present and dominating you and the atmosphere you're in. Four, when the saints witness, the church will grow exponentially. I got a little job application I want everybody to fill out right quick. And, and it's an easy job, okay? Here's the job. You ready? Here's the job. 
I need you to, to, to sign up for this job where you, you tell five people about Jesus in a seven-day week. Everybody, tell five people about Jesus. That'd be, you don't even have to be very good in your percentages of success. If one of the five people you tell about Jesus says yes, not to you, but to him, praise the Lord. And I can tell you now, his average is going to be better than that. Now, they might not tell you, and they may do their thing in another location. You won't get to mark them down on your paper, because we all want to mark our successes down on our paper, claiming God's successes as our own. Praise the Lord. But five people you tell about Jesus, one of them say yes to the Lord, and that means in the course of a year, 52 people will have come to Jesus because you did your job. You got it? I need applications online right now. You can start sending them in right now. I guarantee you everybody's going to get hired. Okay? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can witness in sign language. You can witness in written form. If you're shy, you can just blink your eye. But whatever the Lord gave you to work with, if you tell people about Jesus, just matter of fact, some of y'all don't, you, you're going to witness, you're going to hand out the word. You're going to hand out Bibles. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You, you're going to guide people to, to places where, where the preacher's preaching online, but you're going to witness five people every week. What a job. What a job. Amen? What a job. Get a job now. Nobody need to be unemployed, and not, not in the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Everybody's going to get hired. I guarantee it. If they don't hire you, come tell me. We're going to straighten it out. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, when the saints witness the church grow exponentially. Last, last things, and we, we'll be ready to land the plane. Transition, Calvary, Disciple, Pentecost, and Antioch. These are just definitions, but they're important definitions to know. Transition means when something is changing. We know it. We sense it. After you shut the world down for a, a, an entire year, you cannot help but sense and know that there are going to be changes. People's mentality toward everything has shifted. We who are in the body of Christ must be wise and we must be conscious. We must embrace, and I want you to Google it, look it up, we must embrace the Issacharian motif, the Issacharian spirit, people who understood the times. There were men who understood the times and knew what the people of God needed to do. Amen? Okay. There's a transition. Things are moving from one state and condition to another. Calvary. Where Jerusalem is located, there's a hill not far outside, uh, and it's where Jesus was crucified in an open air representation. Uh, it's an experience of very intense and mental suffering, and the Roman soldiers would govern that process, and they set this thing up. The government of Rome set it up where they would openly do this to people to put fear in them and say, don't y'all ever try to do anything that's above Caesar. And one of the main things the Christians were saying is, this way, way, way past Caesar. This way above Caesar way out of Caesar's league, and it was a direct affront on Roman civilization and government. All right, now, the disciple is a follower or a student, one who is observing and making a decision for and following. They were disciplined, and um, it, it's a follower, student of a teacher, leader, philosopher, personal follower of Jesus during his lifetime, especially one identified as an apostle. The last two, Pentecost and Antioch. A Christian feast, and we, we went through this definition a little bit earlier, 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Ghost. They were together. They were waiting on him. They were hungry for him. They were calling out for him. They want him. We do as well. And then finally, Antioch is the place where believers in Jesus Christ were first called and labeled Christians. Amen. The disciples and followers of Christ were identified. This group was called Christians. I want to welcome you into this body of Christians right now. 
If you're here tonight on the broadcast or you watch it later and you want to say yes to God, do it now. Surrender, that's giving up your style uh, and, and acknowledging the fact that there's a better way, a higher, a more excellent way, a way that includes peace and power. And that's through Christ Jesus. We believe in Jesus. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you won't be either. Spending time in the presence of God, spending time in his, in his, in his spirit will bless you in a way you'll never want to turn back and abandon this ever for the rest of the time that you live. And so I praise God, even right now, for those people that we welcome to the body of Christ. You are saying yes to Christ now. Forgive me for my sin. I believe in you, God. I believe in Jesus. I want to be forgiven. I want to be clean. I want to be stronger. And I need help. Say yes to the Lord. And we say to you, welcome home. And we praise God for your decision. It will affect your future and the future of all the people in your life. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to join me. Uh, if you missed sowing your tithe, I'm going to ask you to make sure to do that. You're a mature, seasoned believer in God. You know you've already been blessed, and so you simply were away, or maybe you forgot or missed the opportunity. We've been very busy over the last um, several days, uh, and so I want for you to catch up sowing your tithe into the ministry. We're, we're going to bring um, our love for Christ to the world and we need for you to pay attention. The Love Center is a family of servants and we serve through being a blessing. We bring the word to people. We touch people's lives on a daily basis. Be supportive of too early in the morning, supportive of Bible study, supportive of our worship celebration and move in close, lock in tight, open your mouth with me and repeat this covenant uh, confession, not as a dead idol, but as a seed I sow. I won't eat my seed anymore. Use this Bible study time as a time to connect, not as a debt that you owe, but as a seed that you sow. And promise God you won't eat your seed anymore because we all need our harvest. God bless you. I'm glad you came. Glad you joined us. Thank you for the time that you invested. It's time well spent. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest with us. Holy Spirit, abide with us until we meet again. God's people said amen. Peace. Thank you for being a support to our ministry. There are two simple ways to support and to communicate with us here at the Love Center. Please text the words pray, love, or donate to 404 Five nine four five seven one seven. Text the word pray to send your prayer requests. Text the word love for information on salvation. Or text the word donate to support our ministry. If you would like to mail your gifts, please send them to the Love Center at P.O. Box 310-660, Atlanta, Georgia, 31131. Start your day with Byron Broussard and 2 early in the morning, Monday through Friday at 8.15 a.m.